All right, everybody, welcome back. We're gonna go ahead and get started with session five. Um, our presenters this session are Chris Tangway from MIT, Cara De Simone of the Society of Florida Archivists, and Jennifer McGillan from Mississippi State University. Um, and as a reminder, we will hold the questions for um, the end of the session. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters. Hi. Um, so our my first uh, lightning talk here is words matter, gatekeeping language and job descriptions. So semantics, that's what words mean. Uh, semantics actually affect who applies to your jobs. So today I'm briefly going to address the gatekeeping language that can keep a diverse group of candidates from applying to your positions. While I'm focusing on gatekeeping affecting disabled applicants, some suggestions apply more broadly to other under underestimated groups. And a big thanks to Ruchika Tulshian for suggesting the use of underestimated rather than underrepresented. So first, a quick introduction. Hi, I'm Chris Tangway. I'm a processing archivist at MIT and I have invisible disabilities. I mentioned this so you know where I'm coming from. So let's dive into why words matter. I'd like to start with this quote from David M. Perry. Uh, it's, and his quote is, it's likely that companies and universities would be happy to accommodate disabled employees, but their hiring processes close that door. To compound on this, it's possible that institutions may not even be aware of how some practices, which have become fairly standard, may be preventing candidates from even applying to open positions. So why does this happen? Largely, it can come, can come down to self-selection. Potential candidates see position requirements and descriptions and may screen themselves out of a potential pool based on the ad alone. They may not see themselves as a viable candidate or decide it's not worth their time to apply given the description of the position, the way an institution describes themselves, or seeing bias in the requirements. So more on requirements. For context, women and minorities tend to believe that they must meet all requirements for positions. Um, one study undertaken by, I think, McKinsey showed that women tend to apply only to jobs where they meet all of the requirements, whereas men tend to apply to jobs where they meet only 60% of the requirements. For minorities, the evidence is more anecdotal than quantifiable. I don't think there's been a big study on that. Um, however, these are definitely things to keep in mind when you're crafting uh, a job description or an advertisement. To give you an idea of the types of requirements archives jobs tend to have that may be problematic, I'm going to share the results of a study conducted by myself and Ann Apney. Uh, we reviewed over 500 job advertisements posted to archives listservs primarily posted to SAA announcements, the SAA announcements list and the former archivist and archives list over the course of um, several years. So our study found that 64% of jobs had requirements related to communication or interpersonal skills. Uh, surprisingly, only 28% had lifting requirements, proving that you don't need to include them if the majority of people aren't. 8% um, required driver's licenses, and only a few had auditory or visual requirements. Any of, these any of these requirements may be excluding individuals uh, from your potential applicant pool. Um, so having a good set of requirements is helpful when it comes to evaluate candidates. Ideally, all requirements should be clear for everyone to understand, easily quantifiable, such as experience with reference versus superior reference skills, and objective. So experience working as part of a team versus excellent interpersonal skills. So 
So what does this all mean for hiring? Best practices uh, for hiring include sticking to, to requirements that reflect the actual duties and responsibilities of the jobs. You know, you want to keep your requirements minimal, generally leaving out preferred qualifications altogether. Um, the one exception to this is if you're trying to game the system by shifting actually required requirements to preferred to game out like any automatic screening that might happen by systems. Um, So sticking to the job duties means like if you're asking for a driver's license, it better be because you're requiring someone to drive a van, not just because you want them to be reliable. Um, including information about the work environment is also helpful. So is the position sedentary? Will you be moving around a lot? So this information may be appealing to candidates with disabilities who have mobility issues or conversely can't sit for long periods of time. Just keep it brief and factual and don't include tasks that aren't an actual day-to-day -day essential job function. Things to include. Um, helpful language to include are words that invoke a growth mindset, such as using phrases like training provided or professional development opportunities implies that you're willing to work on someone and have them um, grow with you instead of coming fully as the fully formed unicorn, a giant list of um, requirements, preferred qualifications may imply. So you wanna to stick to gender neutral language. So that means using second person or third person plural when describing your candidate. It also means using it also means avoiding words that skew masculine or feminine, such as aggressive or compassionate. First up on words to actively avoid is buzzwords and jargon. So certain terms may cause confusion and applicants typically won't apply to jobs they do not understand. Examples like ninja don't have a clear connotation. You're not actually looking for an assassin. You want someone with skills. Circling back to personality traits and why to avoid them. So traits are subjective and hard to evaluate. They encourage people to evaluate based on culture fit, um, which is particularly difficult with um, neurodivergent ca candidates. You may not actually need someone to be enthusiastic about providing instruction. You just need someone who can actually provide instruction. So your ideal candidate, for all you know, may be a Debbie Downer. So there's the, some examples, enthusiastic, outgoing, aggressive. Um, and just to drive it all home, um, you want to avoid exclusionary terms. So you should really think about who you may be excluding with the terms you use. His or her uh, alienates our non-binary friends. Young is ageist and probably illegal to use, so think about that. Uh, fast pace implies a level of ability to move quickly. Um, unless you're working in a production environment, it's probably also unnecessary to include. So, and now I leave you with the final thought of how you can make a difference. And really that's in rethinking everything. Please just rethink everything. Um, just because we always have done something a certain way is not a great reason. Change, it's hard. It requires effort and thoughtfulness. Um, it isn't going to happen if you leave it entirely up to HR. So you have to advocate for changes in the jobs for what you need. Um, and don't just leave it up to HR because they're going to do what they've always done. And please don't leave it to AI. AI is only going to reproduce the same old problems and systems. It takes what everyone's already done and spits it back out at you. So seriously, please do not use AI for job descriptions. I heard that recently in a presentation and I was horrified. Do not do it. <laughs> um, so anyways, thank you. Um, you can find me at ctangway at mit.edu. Uh, I got, use Slides by Slides Carnival, Carnival and Icons by Freepik. So thank you to them. And I will pass it on to the next person.
forgot where all my buttons were. Happy Friday, everybody. And um, just for fun, everybody needs some puppy time, right? Uh, so good afternoon, y'all. I'm joining you from uh, Tallahassee, Florida. Um, this is a presentation on the Society of Florida Archivists and what we're uh, working on to, again, I, I am tickled. I can see definitely why Chris and I are back to back on this one. Um, much thanks to the whole committee who couldn't be here today. We're just kind of doing a one-off and uh, uh, gratitude to the committee's outgoing chair. Um, if you've presented or, or presenting or have presented, thank you for sharing. If you're attending, thank you for being here. Uh, Cross-pollination like this is what keeps us uh, moving. So in a, in a crowded glam job market of limited opportunities for permanent positions and high expectations for the amount of experience accumulated prior to stepping into an entry-level role, how can archives graduates clinch their first real job in the field? And I'm using real in quotes because not two months ago, I was asked if I was a real archivist. So this talk will highlight SFA's recent and ongoing efforts to provide students, recent graduates, and new professionals with paid opportunities to work on meaningful projects and serve as a solid foundation for future career efforts. This presentation is also um, a version of something we presented at the SFA annual meeting, which was just May in Deerfield Beach. Um, this slide illustrates um, a concept called the ladder of precarity. And this is from an article by Carly Wildenhouse called Wages for Intern Work. And the ladder of precarity um, serves to, quote, devalue information work as a whole. For archives establishing, it often is evident in establishing an unstable, often short-term workforce, and the perception thereby that archives needs had been met and at a low cost, meaning that such, con such conditions of deprivation can easily become the new status quo. This puts the long-term survival of archives at risk, which challenges the archival paradigm of long-term preservation and historical importance." End quote. That is exactly, I would guess, where we are now. Um, we have this broken system, right? Um, our profession is dependent on a broken labor hierarchy. Uh, the most stable or permanent employees obviously have tenure or continuous appointments. Um, those are so rare. And then we have um, this very unhealthy relationship with contingent labor that is ongoing. And so this um, image I generated with AI, I think is just really illustrates so wonderfully how we have this gap in the middle too. Um, so that, you know, it's kind of a bleak landscape. And you know, if you're lucky, and somebody extends a handrail to you, you might be able to find a shortcut and find a way around. But more often than not, um, it's, a, it's a slog. It is a, a very difficult climb in a profession that is plagued by privilege, which I will circle back to in just a second. The contingent work, as you see, it uh, continues on down to unpaid internships per task payment, such as crowdsourcing or crowdsourcing and volunteer work. So I, I have mixed feelings on volunteer work. It is useful. It is good for our communities, it is good for our institutions, but there's also an element in some places of predatory volunteering. Um, and that is, say, an example where you're recruiting volunteers for a task that really should be handled by a full-time professional archivist, but you don't have one. So what do we do? We rely on volunteers. And this creates this troubling cycle where we're, we're proving to people that, oh, we can get it done with fewer people, which is absolutely not true. So do volunteer, especially with your professional development organizations, but be very selective about how you spend your time. One of the big reasons that um, this labor equity issue is 
so crucial for us is because we live in a commercial based society, right? You need money. Um, you can't put gas in your car to go to an interview on hopes and dreams. It just doesn't work. Um, and the spousal subsidy that I talked, or I'm sorry, excuse me, the privilege that I talked about earlier is very, very ingrained in our profession that we have, um, you almost always have to have some sort of serious support network, whether it's spousal subsidy um, or living with parents or other family members. In my case, it was veterans benefits. Um, even with a spouse, it would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible, for me to complete an MLIS without um, the housing stipend that the GI Bill came with. So briefly, um, the national ad average entry level archives position is $35,000 a year. I can tell you guaranteed in my state, Florida, that's lower. And in some of your states, I'm sure it's even lower than Florida. Um, so the system is broken. And as Rachel Woody says, um, the place we, we should start is with unpaid internships, kind of down at the bottom of the ladder. And not only is Rachel Woody um, you know, preaching for change. She's also actually um, she's instrumental in the creation of the Northwest Archivist Fellowship, which is um, one of our models that we're looking at. So as I mentioned, this is a rework of an earlier uh, presentation where I learned that um, unpaid workers are not eligible for a lot of benefits and rights that we're all used to having. Um, Obviously, you don't get social security or disability pay in. You don't get vacation time or sick time. Um, the federal the Family Medical Leave Act only kicks in after a year of employment. Um, these are all things that unpaid or, you know, contingent workers are missing out on. And additionally, I learned this year that if you are an unpaid, unpaid worker, you're also ineligible to you, you lose protection against workplace uh, issues such as sexual harassment claims, discrimination claims, anything that you would go to HR for, you have no legal leg to stand on. Um, and that's, you know, instead of enacting legislation to change these things, maybe it's just easier to pay people. Um, so Adam was an ambitious, enthusiastic young professional. He was at the beginning of his career. He was really just getting a foothold. And I was very much looking forward <clears throat> to working with him um, on professional development for our peers. And unfortunately, uh, Adam passed away about two years ago. Uh, and after that, SFA received an anonymous endowment in his name to enact a paid internship program. And that's why we're working on this. Um, Adam used to say contingent labor is whack and, you know, I feel you. So we are pushing this forward in his name to make some changes if we possibly can. Um, we're going to continue to solicit donations. Uh, we want the fund to be sustainable rather than something that we just exhaust in a few years and, you know, yay for a few of you and sorry to the rest. So we're, we're trying to get to a point where it's a rolling donation so that we can continue indefinitely. Um, the internship committee is going to attempt to match repositories in need with early career archivists, including students and recent graduates um, through the connection of SFA leadership. So this, we hope will build community, provide paid foundational experience and combat some of the chronic underfunding that we all face. Um, and I'm trying to just get through the last couple of slides real quick. <clears throat> uh, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, we're actually considered to be a bright outlook profession. Um, and that means that basically we are expected to grow over 10% in the next decade. I don't know where they get these projections from. I would love for us to grow 10% or more. Um, but only if we're taking care of our people. Um, our wages are only expected to rise 5% over 10 years. 
um, it's difficult uh, to work in a career that, to work in a profession where your your work becomes a labor of love rather than an actual career. Um, and if we want to ensure that our profession is healthy over the long term, we need to work on the contingent labor issues that we're facing. And I know not everyone has the power to, um, you know, knock down HR's door, but we can all do small things. And um, as somebody said recently, uh, being nice costs absolutely zero dollars. So check in on your people, check in with your colleagues, bring in donuts like randomly. Everybody loves that day. Um, if you are in a leadership vacuum, mentorship starts with yourself and if you have um, a lack of supervision, mentor yourself as you would want to be mentored and come to programs like the SEAA, SGA Symposium. If you'd like to keep tuned, um, we do have a page on the SFA website and we will be hopefully announcing our first intern at next May's annual meeting in St. Augustine. So thank you very much and I will Pass it on. A real shortage of adorable dogs, but here we go. Okay. All right. We're all seeing the presentation. Someone, someone nod. Okay. Uh, oh, there's the chat. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. So I'm Jennifer McGillan. I'm the coordinator of manuscripts at Mississippi State. This is uh, the disability community is in this meeting with you. Disability Mutual Aid in the Archives. Okay, so the, the background for this is it's based on a chapter I wrote for a book called Preserving Disability, which will, everybody cross your fingers, hopefully be out um, sometime maybe in the next year. Forget, the, the date keeps shifting. Um, but the chapter I wrote was the intersection of personal and professional bodies, disability, mutual aid, COVID-19, and the archives. Uh, it was about centering disability in an archives and special collections department, my department, uh, as a disability community as part of developing operational guidelines during a uh, public health emergency, the COVID-19 pandemic, the early days, um, and how we used the principles of mutual aid to inform our decisions and choices. So when we say we center disability generally, what uh, we mean by that was we asserted that as a department, we we are, were, still are arguably a community and we are, moreover, we are a disability community. Uh, we all have something, a reason to be extra careful, something that made us high risk. I realize that my tenses keep shifting. Um, it's because we are still existing in that state. <laughs> so it's, we were, both past and present is ongoing. Um, English is not good at this. Uh, okay, so it was also a very much a response to the the sort of per, the uh, personal responsibility narrative narrative or approach to COVID mitigation uh, that had been uh, kind of promoted by some of our elected officials that protecting ourselves that protecting oneself is one's personal responsibility. And uh, and what we were starting as a department is that our community was also our personal responsibility. And so the Centering Disability, personally, uh, I use myself as an example of disability when explaining our disability-centered approach. And to assert a disabled identity, I first had to accept uh, that I had one, <laughs> which is uh, kind of a wild thing to say, I realize. Um, so I had my first spinal surgery at the age of 13. I've had chronic pain and limited mobility ever since. And I was used to it, like 30 years or roughly, give or take a year here and there. Uh, and it was background noise, right? 
Uh, and then a week before the world shut down, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. So all of a sudden I had an autoimmune disease and I was taking medication that suppressed my immune system and hello, it's pandemic time. Um, so the way I kind of summarized this uh, was that I was assisting colleagues with determining the operational future of our department while simultaneously trying to, to determine the operational future of myself in the archival profession. How are we going to function? How am I going to function? Uh, and so, um, so was, what I was really writing about was the intersection of personal and professional bodies when the whole self you bring to work is a disabled self. Uh, my concept of myself as disabled, my disabled identity evolved even as I was writing the chapter. I sort of started with the, I'm, I'm not crippled yet. And by the third or fourth draft, I was like, no, I actually, okay, I'm crippled now. Um, and I did also say, I was also talking about how I go back and forth with the words, I choose crippled to use. I realized other people don't. Um, and also talking about how I am disclosing and choosing to disclose this disabled identity from a position of multiple intersecting privileges and also administrative responsibility. So the principles of mutual aid that we applied were roughly, uh, we keep each other safe. Uh, secondly, uh, we won't ask anyone staff to do anything that we faculty won't do, uh, and that we would also not transfer the risk from our department to other affiliated departments. We would not, I mean, the, of course, like everyone else, we had students who were in the middle of research projects. We were frantically scanning things, and we said we, we will not transfer all of the scanning to our digital archives. We will, uh, you know, forcing them to be in the office when we are at home. So we you know, made the effort to, um, you know, to stand up here on the copier and scan things. Um, and they helped out, of course, but it was, we weren't going to be like, all right, your problem now, and then peace out. Uh, and then the third one, uh, which I realize is very dramatic. <laughs> Reviewers had something to say about this. Uh, uh, if if we, if we go, if we go down, we go down together and we go down fighting. And what this, what this meant in practical terms was that uh, we were making the effort to check in with each other, to communicate, to, um, to hash out what our goals were and to you know, present as much of a united front as possible. Uh, so the safety measures that we took uh, were wearing masks in public areas, regardless of vaccination status from March, 2020 through roughly January, 2023. I am still masking. Uh, the, the rest of the department is, uh, is masking sort of intermittently as uh, conditions and, and, you know, evolve or change or, or other things happen and, and require it. But uh, so also we, we were able to lock our front doors to restrict access to the area uh, because the we had just the general public wandering in. We're like, how about no? Uh, so we were able to do that from June 2020 to June of 2021. I should add that we went home when everyone else did in the middle of March and we were back uh, here in uh, rough, I guess this was maybe it was July of 2020. Um, so we were out for about three months. Uh, we were engaging as much as possible in social distancing also roughly through January 2023. And uh, we also have an ongoing, it was ongoing pre-pandemic, it's still, or before the pandemic started, it's still in place now, which is encouraging employees, including students, to stay home if you're not feeling well. That's sort of our general thing. If you please keep your germs at home with you, um, you know, and when we say encouraging, also encouraging and supporting. And, uh, and, you know, and saying, take care of yourself, do what you need to do, we're going to make it work, uh, you know, please do not feel anxious and stressed about coming back to work, even when you are ill. All right, so, uh, so obviously this is a hard thing to reproduce, right? We don't, in many ways, we, we would never ever want to have to reproduce this. Uh, just, you know, I have said this is our, our was our first pandemic. It will not be our last. 
um, but we all at the same time hope it that it will be. So, so applying the principles of mutual aid, I think, uh, is to, to just keep in mind the disability community is not external to the library. It is at work with you. It is, it is in the meeting with you. So when you are making decisions about different operational things, send to your colleagues. Your colleagues are your community. You are part of a disability community, whether you are consciously aware of it or not. Uh, and have the difficult conversations, do the work. That's it. <laughs> oh, I have to stop sharing. Okay, there we go. That is great. Okay, um, we're gonna open it up for questions now so you can unmute yourself or you can put it in the group chat. Well, I will go ahead and start us off. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate all of your presentations. You guys, I feel like each one gave me like new things to think about. Um, but it's true. Like, I feel like you do, if you're privileged enough to not have any disabilities yourself or have close family members that have any, any sort of disabilities, you don't really think about a lot of things. And recently we've had um, one of our, uh, one of my coworkers who was diagnosed with ataxia and she is very quickly losing mobility. And, um, so we've had to adjust a lot to, um, to, to her, um, ataxia and, um, it's a little bit easier to adjust here in the archives, but last year we had, um, like a staff development day that was outside of the archives and we had issues because um, it was a, mostly an outdoor uh, thing that they had us to do. And when we were indoors, we were going into kind of like old rickety buildings <laughs> and things like that. And um, it really brought out, I, I think a lot of us thought about for the first time, um, how inaccessible a lot of these places are. Um, and, and, you know, we think about her and like, she has a long-term disability, but then at the same time we had, I believe three employees who had like broken legs or ankles or something, you know, something temporary. And so, um, I, I guess I, we, and we tried to explain to HR, um, and they tried to be accommodating as much as possible, but I feel like it, the issue that we ran into is they weren't really, getting that anytime they plan something like this, they need to plan it in a way that, that anybody could come up with a broken leg. You know what I mean? Like things like that. Um, you don't have to wait until you have an employee who has this specific disability, like go ahead and make plans ahead of time when you're scheduling these things to make sure that it accommodates, you know, the masses, no matter what their abilities and stuff. So I guess, do you guys have any advice on the best way to like explain that to HR or, you know, should we start like our own little disability union? <laughs> like, you know, with a representative and stuff, I guess. Um, I just, you know, I don't want it to us to keep having events like this where if someone can't go to something because, well, that's just easier than having them change the whole thing. Like they need to go ahead and when planning things, um, keep in mind that they could have people who may not be able to, may not be able to access um a certain thing. So anyway, any advice from any of you about that? Um, I don't, you just have to keep, you just have to keep at them. Yeah. You know, like, you, <laughs> like, like if they're like, Oh, we're going to go here. You have to say, it does that have wheelchair access? And if they're like, why would we need that? We always need that. Does that have microphones? Why do we know we always need microphones? You know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're having, and this, this, this is the one that, that frosts my personal cookies. Okay. Uh, is if you are, if you're having an open bar reception, do you have a non-alcoholic drink that isn't warm water? And they might be like, who wants that? Who cares who wants that? Bring out the cold Diet Coke, right? 
or you know down here i'm like you can't even scrape together some like sweet tea uh and 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 furthermore you always need to have an unsweetened option you need to have sweet tea and unsweet tea right you can't like you need to have coke and diet coke you need to have coke diet coke and tea because some people can't drink soda um and it's or yeah or zero coke what like you know what i mean <laughs> like you have to you have to have something that is an alcohol and you have to do this in a way that people don't feel that they are causing a disruption or making extra work or you know putting somebody out uh, or, or or that 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 their need is something that they need that they need to apologize for um right like you are a community member we are celebrating this community we are having a community gathering and this is this is kind of what i mean by the disabled community is in this meeting with you it may it may not be you it may not be the person across from you but you don't know that right and and every anyone's life can turn on a dime so just you just have to you'd have to be active you have to be a, you have to be proactive not reactive i think and say you know like i use a cane now a couple of years ago i didn't so I, people would be like, oh, right, the cane. And I'm like, yes, yes, the cane. So, <laughs> you know, no, I, I can't get up those those steps that don't have a railing, right? Or, or, or I might be able to, but I may have to hang on to somebody to get up there. Uh, so when I'm looking at places to have things, I'm like, is there an elevator? Does the elevator work? Will the elevator work on the day of the event? Because it's not just me. With, cane, with a cane, right? There may be other people attending with a cane. And even if there's nobody with a cane, the elevator, you need to pick somewhere with an elevator. You need to pick somewhere that if there's a stage, there's a way to get up it without having to climb precipitous stairs with no railing, without me having to like show up and nag somebody about doing it or, you know, anyway, I will get off my hobby horse about this. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I would I would like to add like if you can push for making it a policy that whenever there's an event and like invitations go out that there's always a way that people can respond with their accommodation needs. So like, you know, do you need this? Do you need that? Um and someone mentioned in the chat about, you know, allergies and dietary restrictions. That's also where you include that. Um, because you don't want to, you know, go to a place where there is like no vegan option and you have vegans on the staff, uh, cause we've had that happen and that's not cool. <laughs> um, but, you know, making sure that you're accounting for that. Um, and I think in general, it's a great idea to try to plan things where, you know, you need where people will need the least amount of accommodation. Like, so places that are accessible, um, you know, cause like you never, you, you never know. And, and my favorite phrase is like that the disability community is the only protected class you can join at any time um, because things happen. Uh, so yeah, you never, you never know if someone's gonna like you said, break, break their leg or something like that. And, you know, apart from that, just, you know, having ramps and elevators is helpful for people who like maybe have to bring something along. Like I've, I learned the accessible routes through campus really well from having to drag carts of boxes across campus, like a very unaccessible thing, but also needing to know where are their stairs because I can't go down them. <laughs> um, so being very aware of like those resources, like if they exist on your campus, if there is like um, like an accessible map of accessible spaces, definitely something to always keep in mind. Um, but just making it a habit to ask people like, do you need an accommodation? Do you need this? Do you need that? Because a lot of times people won't ask for an accommodation, but if they're given the choice to like respond to something, they may be more likely to ask for it. Um, but that the other thing is just trying to avoid having to have people ask is is the important part 
that you have to push for and just really like advocate for without necessarily um, always having a plan. Um, I lost my train of thought there, sorry. But hopefully I got the point across. <laughs> Yeah, that was great. And, and some of it also may be just like, there needs to be more education on like, especially with the ataxia situation, because, um, you know, it's not something that just everybody's going to know about. And so, you know, they were very adamant about like, well, we'll make sure that there are ramps instead of stairs and that sort of thing. But it's like, okay, but then you have to walk across uneven ground. And part of the ataxia thing is like you lose your balance really easily and stuff. Or like if you're in a wheelchair, you know, and you're having to go through grass or it's just rained, you know, little things like that. Um, but I think that, you know, it wasn't a matter of not being willing to accommodate. It was just things that people don't necessarily think about. So I wonder if it may also help just to, you know, just educate people a little bit more if, if possible. I, I mean, I think, I think education is, is great, but I think also if there are ways to make things standard policy, that, that can also be very helpful. Like one of the things that, that I was talking about was, um, was sort of advocating for disability from a position of privilege and administrative power and one thing that I have thought about more is who gets or chooses or is able to be the uh, the squeaky disabled wheel, right? Because not everybody does. Because you know, and this sort of goes back to the precarity as well, is that many of these many workers with disabilities are precarious for various reasons. Our profession is very precarious as a whole. And if you have someone who's on a project who is who is feels like they are constantly asking for accommodations, then that can I can see how that would generate a lot of anxiety and distress and so on. And you know, as someone who is department head, if I'm the one saying, "Are we going to have gluten free option?" Then I'm insulated by a lot of privilege. So. Um, so, so for those of us who have those kinds of privilege, I think it is important to take on a little bit of that pestering and nagging and pushing for these accommodations to just exist and to not, you know, to, to take that risk, right? So that the people who are precarious don't have to. I will add one thing. Um, obviously, these great presentations were about archival labor and um, disabilities and like arch archivists as a profession. Um, but it's also thinking about the patron side of things in our reading room. Um, in my current position at Emory, I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised when I started to see that there already were some things in play for our patrons with different abilities. Like we have two, um, two tables in our reading room that adjust height so people who are not disabled still like to use them because they can stand while they use it and what I particularly like about it is that they have the same tops as all the other tables so they're not like they don't stand out as like being different tables um, except for if you're looking at the wires and things yeah so thanks again for your presentations We have a, a lot of um, comments in the chat about ramps not always being accommodating the way we would think they would be. So I appreciate that discourse. Any other questions or comments? I just want to throw in there, based on Kara's uh, presentation, pay your interns. <laughs> if you can pay your interns, pay your interns. Yes, absolutely. We've actually <laughs> recently here at MDAH been able to start paying our interns. So I, I was like, I hate that I, I missed that when I was a student, but I'm happy yeah. for, for the generation coming up that gets that. We there's actually, even, uh, we, there's a lot of movements now where um, there's housing stipends or um, some internships are including housing, especially if they're in remote locations. Um, one of our, our co-chair, his institution does that. Yeah, we actually had to wait for, so our local uh, 
College of Simmons University, and they didn't want to they didn't want their interns to get paid for a while, so we couldn't pay them until they changed their policies. Um, but fortunately, they did, because uh, that's messed up. I know they're still paying more for their internship class than they're getting from us, unfortunately, but we try to put a dent in it at least. Like that, is, that is so weird. Why would you not want your students to get paid? I don't know. I mean, our, our what, we, what we work on here is that we want them to either we want to be able to pay them or they they should get like or they should get academic credit they should get something um we, we absolutely want to pay them if we're at all able to um that's what i what i tell them because sometimes they're like oh i'll do it for free i'm like you will not uh and uh, and, <laughs> and i'm kind of like this profession We'll squeeze you, and we would prefer to not have it start with us. So, anyway. All right, it is two o'clock, and it is time for a seventh inning stretch. Uh, and then we will come back at uh, at, at two fifteen, I believe. Uh, for uh, two fifteen central. Um for the final session in which there will be more dogs uh so all right <laughs>